for the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase. It's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Stop in and save big money on your next outdoor lumber project now at Menards. Menards has the largest selection of AC2 pressure treated lumber and decking, and it's easy to load in our outdoor lumber yard. Plus, you can get free estimates fast with our deck design program in store or on Menards.com. Check out our weekly flyer for more great deals happening now at Menards. Save big money at Menards. Your host, Andrew Donaldson. This is Heard Tell. It's our Tell Show for December the 6th. It's a Monday. We hope you all are having a wonderful start to your week. We hope it was a great weekend for you wherever you are across the street or around the world. Hope the holiday season as it gets cranked up is going well. For those of you that are finishing up uh, celebrating Hanukkah, we hope that was a blessing to you. And wherever you're doing today, thank you for taking time to spend a little time with us. It's Hurtel Radio. I am Andrew Donaldson, your host. Uh, thrilled to be with you. Appreciate your time. Once again, just an effort for us here at Hurtel to try to turn down the noise of the news cycle and get to the actual information of what's going on in the world and try to discern our times a little bit better. Things are rough out there. A lot of stuff going on. What's important to talk about? What's not so important to talk about? What do people focus on that they don't need to focus on? And what are the things that really, really matter to our lives? One of the things about how things are going in the world right now is how we consume media. And a really big media story kind of came to not a conclusion, but the next stage of it over the weekend. In the dark of the night on Saturday night, CNN fired their primetime host, Chris Cuomo. Now, we need to back up a little bit and cover this story because it's not just about media and it's not just about politics. It's not just about his brother, Andrew Cuomo, the disgraced former governor of New York. This is about a story of how we get our media information because CNN, when they're going to put up their little thing about the most trusted name in news and have James Earl Jones intone that in a certain way, it has heft. CNN should be a go-to source for information. But this is a case where we can examine how we get news information and the people that provide it, especially for CNN. Now, we don't want to get lazy. I know it's I've done it, too. I'm guilty. Too many people just complain about the media. Media is too big a term. It doesn't mean anything. It's a nebulous, whatever you want it to mean term. And when we talk specifically about the news media, we're talking about an important part of our society. The free press was so important that the founders of America made sure that it was endued directly into the Constitution. We should have a press, and we need a free press, and we need an adversarial press, quite frankly, because that helps keep accountability in society, both on government and in the populace. So what's going on with CNN and Chris Cuomo is important for us to talk about it, so let's dig into it just a little bit. Back on Tuesday of last week, uh, CNN announced that they were going to suspend Chris Cuomo because of information that came out of the New York Attorney General's report and extra documentation that was revealed uh, about his role in his brother's scandal. Now, if you remember, uh, Andrew Cuomo was a long-term governor of New York. There was accusations of sexual harassment and misconduct around keeping that quiet, silencing that, retaliating against people, and these sorts of things. Eventually, he did have to resign after this attorney general report came out, uh, and the New York Assembly was also launching an investigation that could have possibly led to impeachment. So Andrew Cuomo resigned. Uh, where Chris Cuomo comes into this is, of course, he is holding down the primetime slot on CNN. This is a conflict, not just because of the obvious he can't cover the governor of New York, it's his brother. 
but also because of the way CNN conducted themselves. Let's back up. Going back to 2020, remember in January, February, we start to get into the COVID crisis. CNN made a conscious decision that they were going to use Andrew Cuomo as counter-programming to President, then-President Donald Trump. Andrew Cuomo was going to get all kinds of coverage on CNN. Remember, they were covering his press conferences live. The first really bad wave of COVID in America was centered in New York City. Now, of course, our media is also heavily influenced by New York City, so this was a lot of crossing of streams. But CNN made a decision that they were going to use Andrew Cuomo and promote him and put him as the face of what was going on in COVID. Now, he's the governor of New York, so there's, there is reasons for that. But you see the conflict of interest when his brother is also on the same network. So let's go back. April 14th, 2020. I am reading from Variety magazine. And what happened in April 2020 is Chris Cuomo signed his new multi-million dollar CNN contract. Now, remember what's going on at the time. He had just come out of a period of isolation where he was in his own home with a COVID diagnosis. I want to read you something that is pertinent to the current situation. Quoting Chris Cuomo. But his primetime performance has buoyed the AT&T-owned cable news outlet, meaning CNN. Cuomo Primetime, which launched in 2018, quickly become CNN's most viewed programmer. This is Variety in April of 2020. Fueled by the host's willingness to drop some of the political conventions of on-air interviews and press guests on various topics. In recent weeks, ratings for the program have soared due to viewer interest in news about the pandemic, as well as Cuomo's interviews with his older brother, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. On Tuesday, he tried to make things more clear. Quote, if you listen to this show, you understand the context. Nobody called in and said, are you going to leave CNN? Why? Because it was clear that's not what I was about. I was having legitimate questions, which I had had all along with this administration, meaning the Trump administration. Remember, this is 2020 again let alone with a fever with COVID for two weeks and being blanked off about being sick and rethinking a lot of things on the existential basis all the time. It is frustrating to do this job in an environment where people are not interested and open. Again, this is Chris Cuomo in Variety, April 14, 2020. It is hard to practice journalism when people are so intent on believing what they want to believe for political advantage. It makes you question, is it worth the effort? Can I make a difference? Can I personally make a difference? Is the way I do this working? If it's not working, can I do it differently? Do I want to do it differently? That's Variety back in 2020 when Chris Cuomo signed his new multi-million dollar contract with CNN. Why is that important? Well, because they spent that whole summer and most of the fall presenting Andrew Cuomo, then the governor of New York, as the counter-program counter programming on CNN as the standard of what should be done. And Chris Cuomo, the primetime host, also hosted him quite a bit on his program, which brought up all kinds of red flags at the time. Now, if he did it once or twice and it was just a palsy, hey, you're my brother, that would be one thing. But this was a pattern of behavior. In fact, it got so bad that by June, Chris Cuomo had to take to Twitter and he said, and I'm quoting here, not objective, but true. The facts tell the story. New York had and has its struggles, but they're doing way better than what we see elsewhere. And no way that happens without the love gov, he's referring to his brother, dishing out the real 24-7. He works with relentless intensity and New York's better for it. And as a brother, I am proud. Now we have the context of what happened in August of this year. The attorney general's report comes out of New York about the role of Chris Cuomo working with the comm shop and the communications people of his brother to try to deal with the sexual harassment allegations. And just with the information we know and not the nebulous additional information CNN teased in the firing comment, but we know for a fact that he was advising his brother on media strategy why he is a principal member of one of the biggest media outlets in this country. Now, we all get lazy on social media and talk about media bias or the bias of the media, but that's silliness. That doesn't really explain anything because we're all humans. We all have bias. I don't have a problem with bias in the media. I can discern myself who has bias and who doesn't, especially in the modern age where we have social media and most of the media personalities. We can find out what they're about with just a little bit of effort. It's not the bias. 
This is something much deeper. I want to put it to you this way, and I've said this before because I tweeted about it, about that June 24th tweet Chris Cuomo tweeted. This is how I responded to it, and I think it still holds true. CNN, like all news networks, is a business model first, a TV show second, an exclusive in-club third, and a journalism endeavor somewhere a distant fourth. We have evidence that CNN does this because when they made the announcement of the suspension of Chris Cuomo, Jeffrey Tubin was sitting at the desk in the studio to the side of the anchor that was reading the announcement. We won't, because this is a family-friendly program, get into what Jeffrey Tubin did earlier this year. Just know any other company in the world, especially in America, he would have been fired, banished, and never allowed in the building again. Yet he gets back into CNN. Why? Because it's a business model first, a TV show second, an exclusive in-club third, and a journalism endeavor a distant fourth. He's in the in-club. He gets back in. Why was the Cuomo situation allowed to fester at CNN? Because let's be adults here. They knew all along what was going on. They knew that getting Chris got them access to Andrew and vice versa. They knew that there was a multi-million dollar contract signed back in 2020 with Chris Cuomo that was going to make him very hard to get rid of. They got rid of him and finally fired him with a bunch of legalese, meaning, okay, the lawyers found enough that we can fire him for cause and not pay him this contract. It'll go to court. There'll be a settlement. That'll be down the road. But we have a disgraced governor of New York in Andrew Cuomo. Now we have a disgraced anchor of Chris Cuomo. And the one thing that should have been obvious to everybody is that this is how it was going to end. CNN knew all along. They don't get any credit for firing Chris Cuomo. They don't get any credit for suspending him because they knew exactly what they were going to get. And if they didn't know, they didn't know on purpose. Remember, CNN has its own investigative arm. That's what they brag about. They're going to investigate things. They're going to explain to us, the public, what's really going on. And it's an interesting thing and a very important thing to understand that the people that are supposed to be giving us information have their own agendas. Sometimes those agendas are benign. In the case of CNN, for the better part of the last two years, they clearly had an agenda that actually did damage to public information. Shame on them. Shame on the Cuomos. Shame on the people at CNN that allowed this farce to continue. We understand our media is going to be biased. That's You just got to be an adult and understand that, hey, I can still glean good information from sources that have bias because the bias tells us how they're giving us information. That's not the problem. Bias media is not necessarily the biggest problem in the world. But media that is purposefully deceptive of people is a problem. And anybody that had a brain could tell that having the brother of the New York governor on a news network was going to cause problems. And by the way, Andrew Cuomo's issues were pretty well known long before the AG report came out. That just put it on paper. There had been whispers for years. There had been accusations for years. And there was a power structure in the AG report that we're finding out now in place to protect the things that he was doing. And part of that power structure, as it turns out, was sitting on camera at CNN all along. Don't like stories like this, but how we intake our media, that's one of the more important things because it's how we get our information and we need to discuss it. And this will happen again at some point. It's not just CNN and it's not just the Cuomo brothers. It's just human nature. And the way we get human nature presented to us on camera and in print and online is important in a world where discernment needs to be the currency of our day so that we know what's going on. We'll be back with more Herd Tell right after this. It's Herd Tell Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you for joining us. We hope your Monday is going well. Uh, And another story that touches on not just news that is in the media, but how that information gets to us. You may have noticed and you may have heard tell that Vice President Harris has been in the news quite a bit lately, and it's not been for things she's doing in her role as being vice president. There has been a steady drip, drip, drip of stories about the vice president how she conducts herself, what her role in the White House is. Now, some of this is political, of course. 
uh, there was a spat a few weeks ago where you had contrasting stories about her and about Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. Now, of course, both of them were contenders in the 2020 Democratic primary, and both were defeated by the eventual President Joe Biden, who they now both ostensibly work for. So there's always a political element to these things. But once again, in the Washington Post, we have a story out. This one is written by Cleve Woodson and Tyler Panger. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. I apologize if I'm not. And the headline says this, a Kamala Harris staff exodus reignites questions about her leadership style and her future ambitions. Now, before we delve into this, let's be a little bit fair. Any position in the White House, whether it's the president's staff, the vice president's staff, uh, many of the other things in Washington, these are extremely high turnover jobs because they're very stressful jobs. They're all consuming jobs. Uh, A lot of the jobs, especially the staffer level jobs, these are 12, 14, 15 hour a day jobs. It just sucks the absolute life out of you. It is a reason we call it public service. You pretty much cease to do anything other than the job you have. So there's an element to that. What has brought about this recent spat of stories is the news that Simone Sanders, um, who has been serving as the spokeswoman for the vice president for the last few months while she was in office, and probably more famously, was a very important surrogate and an effective surrogate for uh, Joe Biden as he made his run to the White House. You may recall the incident where she physically removed somebody who rushed the stage. Uh, Simone Sanders is an important figure. She gets things done. She's effective. She's excellent on television and as an advocate. So for her to leave the white, the vice president's staff raised quite a few eyebrows. Now, to be fair here, she says it doesn't have anything to do with the vice president necessarily. She's planning on getting married next year. She has some personal things she wants to work on. And something we should keep in mind with somebody like a Simone Sanders, when they're in these jobs, it's not just that job. She was also on the Biden campaign for the better part of a year and a half before she went in the White House. You're talking about two and a half, three years of her life nonstop, directly involved in these political things. These things wear on you. Just look at pictures of Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, our last three presidents, when they entered office and when they left office and how much they aged in eight years of full term presidencies. The presidency is not easy. It's very hard. That's why questions about President Biden's age and condition were legitimate questions, because it's a very taxing job. And even though the vice president has a different schedule, it's no less relenting. So is there smoke or there's fire? where this story is concerned. Well, the constant drip, drip, drip is not so much about Vice President Harris herself, but it's about how things get done. What do I mean by that? Well, let's explain it a little bit. Most political journalism nowadays, especially in D.C., is what's called access journalism. Anytime you see something that has an unnamed source or a quoted source, you're getting information from somebody on the inside. Now, The problem is that's relational, which means they tell you things you can't always print. They tell you things you can't put on a news story until later. They tell you things on background. They tell you things off the record. There's an exchange of information and exchange of services involved there. And it's not like something where people would say a quid pro quo is bad. It's just how stuff gets done. You scratch their back, they scratch your back a little bit. This is why one of our maxims here is we always say there's no such thing as a leak. When somebody doesn't want something to come out, it doesn't come out. If something comes out and it's sourced and it has an unnamed source, it's out because somebody wanted it to be out. So all this about Vice President Harris is coming from somewhere. Now, we're not exactly sure where, but we can use some logic here. Before we to delve into that, though, let's back up and remember our recent history, though. She is vice president because she ran for president and her campaign for president did not go well. She bowed out in the fall, in the winter, early winter, I guess, before she ever made it to Iowa. She was backed by some real heavy hitters. She had some ver- strong support within the party apparatus. She was widely considered by some to be the next person up. The fact that she is a female and the fact that she is a person of color checked a couple boxes that folks really wanted to see do. And the fact that she's the first female vice president and of color is important in a historical sense. But it's important to remember that she was not rejected by the entire country. She was up in the Democratic primary. 
Democratic primary voters are the one that rejected her campaign. And when you start seeing these stories currently about the vice president and she's having a little bit of trouble with staff and accusations of dysfunction in her management style, these are things that also played her campaign. Her campaign was being run by a family member, which is never really a good idea usually. And her campaign was plagued by a lot of these same issues. They had trouble holding on to staffers. They had trouble keeping a coherent message. They went for a lot of splashy optics types thing that didn't go well, most famously and most notably in the debates where she went after now President Biden, who at the time was running against her in the primary on some of his previous stances on things like busing. Remember, she said it in the debate and then in the way our modern cycle and news cycle works. They were tweeting out the T-shirts with the saying as soon as it came out of her mouth on the debate stage. And we remember those clips and how that worked, and it didn't really work out well for her. There was other incidences as well. So some of these things are historic with her that there is a pattern of behavior. Now, does that go back further? Remember where Vice President Harris came from. She came out of California. She was uh, an attorney general for the state. Uh, she came out of San Francisco, which is one of the bluest areas in the, in the country uh, as a prosecutor district attorney. She was the attorney general for the state of California. Then she was a senator in the state of California. And now she's the vice president of the U.S. This is important to note because how she came to power is part of who she is as a, an official and as a leader. In football, we have a term called system quarterback, you may have heard. It's quarterbacks who are talented and are able to do things, but they have to have everything around them work just a certain way for them to be effective. They have to be in the right system. They have to have the right supporting cast. They have to have all these things outside of them for them to be successful. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just is what it is. But they call them system quarterbacks. They got to have a system. They got to have a coach. They got to have a lot of help. The accusation for Vice President Harris is that she was a system quarterback. She came out of very blue California. She's never really ran races that didn't involve just fighting off other Democratic opposition. And her one time on the national stage in the 2020 primary didn't go well at all, and she was one of the first to drop out of the race of the major players. This is stuff that if she's going to have ambitions and the keep talking about ambitions and as vice president, a lot of people think she should be next in line for a run at the White House itself. These are questions she's going to have answered and these are things she's going to have to fix. So while the dysfunction stuff may or may not be fair and it's just part of the politics of the day for Vice President Harris and her supporters and a Democratic Party that clearly would like for her to be next in line and to take a step forward, there's some legitimate problems here. And it's not just on the right, and it's not just conservatives. This is inter-party stuff. The Pete Buttigieg folks are already using their whisper campaign that he should be a candidate in the very near future. And let's call something else what it is. She works for, Vice Pre for President Biden as the vice president. He could stop a lot of this anytime he wants to. That he doesn't is telling. The vice president Harris may unfairly be getting some criticism, but that's also part of the gig. But there's a pattern here, and there's things about her that if she's going to be successful in the future, she's going to have to come up with answers for. And it plays into one of her greatest weaknesses, though. On camera, when pressed, she does not answer personal criticism very well. And we'll have to see how that plays out in the future. We'll be right back with more Heard Tell right after this. Now let me see you go off like a bomb. It's Hertel Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you for staying with us. We appreciate your time. However, you're listening, if you're watching on YouTube or the other streaming services, or if you're getting this on one of the podcast platforms, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you may be listening, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, we sure appreciate it. If you could take a time to leave a comment and a rating, we'd sure appreciate that and let somebody know what we do. We work hard to not waste your time. And if you tell them that they can get good information here where we turn down the news cycle noise and talk about things that really matter. We'd sure appreciate it, and we appreciate all you. Going into the holiday season, of course, let's talk about something a little lighter. Uh, at Ordinary Times, ordinary-times.com, my colleague Brian O'Nolan, who's an extremely talented writer, has been doing a series on Advent and Hanukkah and other holiday music through now through the end of the year. 
Well, his latest post, he took on something that he calls, and I'm going to quote him, although I agree with him, musical crimes against Christmas, having dealt with some of the beloved classical songs and some other, you know, sacred music and things that come with the holidays. He's also started to touch on songs that take the holidays to make a really bad musical song. And there has been some terrific music that has been aimed at Christmas. It's a long list. Uh, And as he points out, it seems like you either write something modern music that is completely forgettable or it becomes epically bad and people never forget it. He takes three examples, and I agree with him on all three examples of really bad Christmas music. Uh, Oddly enough, two of them come from the Beatles, who were, of course, one of the most influential and popular bands of all time, and one from a super group that should have never happened in the first place. Let's dig into it. He starts out with a personal song of mine that when I hear it on my radio or on my stream, well, it's not on my stream because I'd never allow it, but if it pops up on the radio, I immediately change the channel. Sir Paul McCartney's simply having a wonderful Christmas time. And I will just read Brian because he says it much better than I can. Uh, Quoting from his piece, Sir Paul McCartney, 50% of one of the most influential music writing units in popular music, laid what might be one of the biggest individual stinkers of them all with Wonderful Christmas Time. There's nothing good to say about this song, not even that it eventually ends, because it sticks in your head like the hellish offspring of John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt and the theme from the Smurfs. I imagine the song's genesis being Paul McCartney looked into a studio and told he could leave in one hour if he could write and record a Christmas single, otherwise he'd be strapped to a table and be made to listen to Yellow Submarine on a loop for 24 sleepless hours, and the jackass refused to take one for the team and fostered this steaming pile of musical poop on Western culture. They'll weigh this against Hey Jude and Forgive Me, he thought. Oh, will we? The melody? Lame. The lyrics? Lame. The instrumentation? Childish. Childish and lame. But Brian, you said, and I'll hear none of it. He plays the piano in the video, even though there's no piano in the song. That's John Cougar Mellencamp level lame. Not to be outdone, he also takes aim at his at uh, Paul McCartney's writing partner, John Lennon. And he says, and I'm quoting from his Ordinary Dash Times article again from Brian O'Nolan, quote, maybe Sir Paul was feeling some heat from the other 50% of his sometimes writing duo, John Lennon, whose 1972 protest song, Happy Xmas War is Over, is pure, unrefined musical sewage. It is apparent that no one knew throughout the early 60s, that John Lennon was just one avant-garde artist girlfriend away from a complete break with reality. It seems rather predictable in retrospect. I mean, once you've crossed the line between a dreamer and a person who earnestly calls a press conference in bed to end the Vietnam War, there's no going back, right? The next logical step is to write a Christmas song and use children to declare that war is over. And I don't want to shock anybody, but uh, there are still wars. And is there a creepier way to begin a song than a fervently whispered stereo pan, happy Christmas, Yoko, and a happy Christmas, John? I blame every explainer on needlessly politicized family holiday gatherings on this song. And not to be outdone, Brian O'Nolan writing in Ordinary-Times.com brings up what I think is not only the worst Christmas song of all time, but a strong contender for worst song of all time. Ladies and gentlemen, do they know it's Christmas? Now, if you don't remember or you don't know the backstory, this is the hellacious auditory hellscape that Bob Geldorf fostered on the world uh, back in the 80s. It was a super group of just all the pop stars they could get in one room that were upright and coherent enough to record. It was for a good cause. It was for feeding hungry people in, China, in Africa. But this thing went off the rail quickly. I will read from the post again at Ordinary Dash Times. This is Brian O'Nolan writing, quote, The worst Christmas song, but also the worst song to be a global success bar none. It is insipid, ignorant, and poorly written. Its only purpose was to ensure that the self-obsessed pop figures that made it could assuage their guilt by doing something. How meaningful that something was the people of Africa is not clear for the impoverished of a place they poorly understood called Africa. Given that Bob Geldof turned the appearance of caring into a cottage industry, it would appear that this song did a bang up job of giving artists adequate remittance for their sins of success. Do they know it's Christmas? Well, the followers of Islam don't care. The cops knew long before you did. And where do I find an ice pick to stab my eardrums into useless bleeding masses dripping out of my skull so I don't have to listen to this ever again? 
As the story goes, some band nobody has cared about for 35 years walked into the studio, dropped a giant bag of coke on the table, and everything went to hell from there. The lyrics are a train wreck from the beginning. It's Christmas time. There's no need to be afraid. All time, Christmas time, we let in light and we banish shade. The hell? Who suggested that we needed to be afraid? The rhyme is lazy and desperate. But say a prayer. Pray for the other ones. Oh, the other ones, you say? You mean residents of that entire continent? Surely it can't get worse than that. There's a world outside your window, and it's a world of dread and fear, where only water flowing is bitter sting of tears. Sweet, fancy Moses, where to begin? Brian O'Nolan goes on from there. You can read his piece at Ordinary-Times.com and his entire Advent and Hanukkah series. We'll be back with more Hertel Radio right after this. Welcome back to Hertel Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday, December the 6th. I uh, hope your Monday is going well. hope you had a great weekend and hope your week goes well for you as we continue our relentless pursuit into the end of the year of our Lord 2021. And we're just about there, folks. We got a couple of holidays to get out of the way and then it'll be on to 2022. Hope you all are well. Hope wherever you are, you and yours are happy and well fed. Continuing to get more and more information out of the Oxford High School shooting up in Michigan. Uh, If you missed it over the weekend on Friday night, uh, early Saturday morning, the news broke that on Friday night that the parents of this Ethan Crumbly, the school shooter involved, the parents were apprehended. Uh, They were found in a commercial type building where they had been, uh, their lawyer said they were hiding from media pressure. The police say they were running from them because they are charged and they are now in the same uh, detention facility that their son is in. More and more questions are coming out of this shooting uh, from the Washington Post. The Michigan high school student accused of fatally shooting four classmates had numerous conversations with school counselors in the days and hours before the shooting, before staff sent him back to class despite finding images of bullets on his phone and disturbing drawings at his desk, the superintendent told parents in a detailed letter. This is from Brian Pesh in the Washington Post. The Coe's conversations will be part of an independent investigation into the school's actions, the superintendent of Oxford Community Schools, Tim Throne, said. In a lengthy note to families on Saturday, Throne said he had requested that an investigation be done by an independent security consultant, so we leave no stone unturned after concerns were raised that the school did not do enough before the shooting to prevent the rampage. The email also detailed the school's accounts of events preceding the shooting, which took place last Tuesday, and left four dead and seven injured. The days before the shooting, 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly was found by a teacher to be viewing images of bullets on his phone during class. When questioned by a counselor and another staff member, Crumbly said he and his mother had recently gone to a shooting range and that shooting was a family hobby. The next day, Throne wrote, his parents confirmed his account. The morning of the shooting, a teacher noticed drawings and writings allegedly done by Crumbly and reported them to the school counselor and the dean of students. The Oakland County prosecutor, Karen McDougall, described a violent drawing that included the words, quote, the thoughts won't stop, help me, quote, blood everywhere, was scrawled next to a drawing of a bullet, and there was a sketch of a bloody figure with gunshot wounds. Crumley was brought to the guidance counselor's office, where he said the drawings were, quote, part merely of a video game he was designing, Throne said in the note. Crumbly told the counselors he wanted to pursue video games As a career, Crumbly's parents were summoned to the school. While waiting for them, he stayed in the office for more than an hour and a half while counselors continued to observe, analyze, and speak to him. Once they arrived, his parents were informed that they were seeking counseling within 48 hours or the school would contact Child Protective Services. The parents refused to take him home and left, leaving counselors to send him back to class rather than send him home to an empty house. This was around 10 a.m. that morning and the shooting occurred slightly before 1 p.m. So what do we make of this? Now, we need to be careful with all this information because we're still in the early stages of this. There's going to be a, we can probably guess, a lengthy and drawn-out trial, not only of uh, Ethan Crumbly, but of both his parents. There's going to be a lot of layers and a lot of complexities to this case. What is very, very clear is there was 
cascading systemic failure on everything around this kid's life that had failed and wound up causing this, starting with his parents. Clearly, there was a lot of folks, and I did too, recoiled when the parents were initially charged. But now if we find out more and more stuff, this, this, there's something clearly very, very wrong in this home. There's something very, very clearly wrong with how these parents interacted with the school when they brought up uh, concerns that they had. We have now from the evidence that is being publicly released, text messages from the mother to the son about the bullet incident in class and what he was saying and the way she seemed to, and we're just speculating, but it seems to be that she was kind of laughing it off. There's a lot of wrong here before this kid ever showed up at the school with the gun. Now, people are going to focus on the gun part, which they should. How did he get the gun? Are the parents liable for him having to get the gun? It seems now that they got it specifically for him. That's what the prosecutors are alleging. There's also a long element here of what was the school's culpability. How was this kid in a meeting about being violent and nobody thought to check his bag where he presumably had this gun during this entire ordeal the morning of the shooting? Why was he sent back to class unsupervised? Why did the parents refuse to take him home and just left? There's a lot of questions here that are going to go far beyond this case. We've seen over and over again in these school shooting things, there's just no way that we're going to make every school in America a hardened facility that is bulletproof, for lack of a better term. There's no such thing. How these schools interact with problem children, how schools interact with their parents, what do the school system do when a parent is uncooperative? What do parents do when a school won't help them if it was a different circumstances? These are all existential questions that we need to be wrestling with. I don't think we're going to do it over this case. Remember what we've seen in America over the last couple of major court cases we have, like the Rittenhauer case and others. You have a court case and then you have really two cases in the media and in the narrative at the same time. You have what's going on in the courtroom, which is legalese, which is complicated, which is almost in a language that people don't understand because court cases uh, follow very specific rules. You're only allowed to talk about certain things. Evidence has to be admitted. You can only discuss things in a certain manner. And then there's the media narrative and the way the news media covers the case. In the case of the Kyle Rittenhouse coverage, the way it was covered was completely different than what was actually occurring in the courtroom. If you paid attention to what was going on in the courtroom, what happened at the end didn't surprise anybody. But a lot of people never paid attention to what was going on in the courtroom. I think that's going to be the case in this case as well. There's probably a very high suspicion that this is going to get really ugly. These parents were obviously avid about guns and weapons. They were very politically outspoken on their social media pages. So that's going to get drug into it. In the days going forward, as they start to press the issues with this court case and the crumblies, we need to remember that we need to keep perspective that there's not just one core cause of why this tragedy happened, why this wicked act of killing four human beings happened. It's a layered thing. There is obviously horrible parenting here. There is obviously a very troubled kid who acted out and made it criminal, and we're not excusing him one little bit. Uh, he needs to pay for his crime to the full extent of the law. But there is bad parenting here. The school system failed here. This kid obviously indulged himself in his worst instincts to the point that it became violent. There's a lot wrong here. We need to askew anybody who's going to say there was one major cause to this incident. There's a problem with how our schools deal with parents. There's a problem with how our parents deal with schools. There's a problem with dealing with troubled children in our entire country. And when you put in something like the gun debate on top of it, it just makes the volume go up and the truth a little bit harder to find. All these issues individually need to be discussed. Putting them all together and then saying just the one out of the half dozen involved is the core cause isn't going to be productive here. But that's how our news media works. That's how we work. That's how our social media works. So try your best to askew that. This is going to be complicated. It's going to be drawn off. Be slow to speak. Spend a lot of time reading and listening. And as this develops, let's try to find things we can do in the future to prevent this from happening again. Because it keeps happening again because we never seem to ever want to learn the lessons. And we'll be back in a few minutes with more Herd Tell. Back 
back to Hertel Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us on the latest Hertel podcast, where we do long form discussions and turn down the noise on the news media cycle and get into real deep information with knowledgeable guests. I recently had on Abby Hall Blanco. She's a professor of economics at Bellarmine University, a Young Voices contributor, and uh, somebody we've talked to on radio before. Uh, about economics and other issues that she dealt with. And part of the discussion we touched on, we want to play for you now from that episode of Herd Tell Podcast that you can find on all the major podcasting platforms and on YouTube as well. She talks about how economics is something that most people have trouble maybe approaching or understanding, but it's something that affects everybody's life. How do we bridge that gap? How do we get good information from a news media cycle that isn't really invested in explaining something like economics, but just making it as part of the narrative? We talked to Abby Hall Blanco about that, and she tells it and explains it like this. It's part of the problem when we discuss economics, especially in America and our current media environment, that we don't understand that there's a lag time, that we don't understand it like, yeah, we have a president, but he's been president for roughly a year and there was a guy before him. And then the guy that was before him had a guy before him. They have lag times. There's there's a lot of this who gets caught in what chair at what time. Is that part of the problem when we discuss economics is we just kind of look at that national political saying and we don't understand it. Like, look, there's waves and layers and nuances to these economic problems that don't fit into our news cycle just perfect. And then people don't get the information on the economy that they really need to kind of make good decisions about things like holiday spending or like planning for next year when something that happened 18 months ago is going to affect the second quarter of next year and things like this. So I think that there's definitely part of that. Um, one of my areas of research is what's called public choice economics or the economics of politics. And one of the things that we talk about within that body of literature is exactly what you mentioned, is that sometimes who gets caught kind of holding the bags is who happens to be there at the time. Mm. Whereas, as you point out, sometimes it's not the person who actually is currently sitting in the chair that is the person who implemented the the policies. Um, There are a variety of different factors that people can look at. Some of them are within the control of policymakers. Some of them are out of control of uh, policymakers, regardless of how much we would like to think that the policymakers are in control of some of these things. and so there's there's definitely some of that. Um, one of the other things that I always point out to people, too, is that when we talk about um, the economy, there's not you can't master like economic understanding in in all areas. So right. when people are like, I'm really confused about what's going on right now, like I'm opening um, I'd say a newspaper, but no one reads newspapers anymore. <laughs> like I open my email inbox in the morning or I turn on the TV and I just don't understand all of the things that are going on. Um, and it's totally understandable because uh, we as professional economists are trying to make heads and tails of a lot of the stuff that that's going on right now too. And so understanding any particular issue, whether you're wanting to look at inflation, if you're wanting to look at the supply chain, if you're wanting to look at um, COVID policy or whatever type of policy that you want to look at, all of these things have different economic implications of them, and they are all in their own right remarkably complicated. The entire conversation with uh, Dr. Abby Hall Blanco, economist at Bellarmine University and a Young Voices contributor, is available on iTunes, Spotify, all the platforms podcasting platforms wherever you get your podcast look for that the video version is also available on youtube so seek that out and hear the entire conversation i'm andrew donaldson this is her tell radio and we'll be right back after this Welcome back to Hertel Radio. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the program today, Monday, December the 6th, as we careen towards the end of the year and continue to articulate our way through the holiday season. Uh, It's a season of joy, hopefully, for you, but it's also usually a season of chaos. So y'all make sure you're taking care of yourselves and each other out there. We talked about the Michigan school shooting case. Uh, it's going to be a whole lot of ugly, and because it's going to go to a complicated, three complicated criminal trials with three suspects, with the parents being charged now, uh, it's a very dark story, a very sad story. 
um, there was a little bit of light that came out of this over the weekend. Uh, one of the victims uh, that died was a football player from Oxford High School named Tate Meyer. Uh, if you're on social media, you probably saw the video of Tate in his football uniform. His jersey number was 42. Uh, that video made the rounds. There are reports that he was killed actually trying to stop the school shooting. Um, one of the real tragedies of this story, it seems like all of the four kids killed and the other ones that are wounded, some that are still in the hospital, uh, were really, really good kids. Uh, they were athletes. They were involved in extracurriculars. They had friends. And anytime a young person is killed, it's just utterly tragic. And when it's something utterly senseless like this, it makes it even more so. So the University of Michigan football team, the Wolverines, uh, one of the best teams in the country, having a banner season, uh, wanted to honor uh, the victims and specifically uh, Tate Meyer, who was the football player. Uh, so they wore on their jerseys for the Big Ten championship game this weekend, which they won in a blowout as they marched towards the college football playoff. They wore a patch on their uniforms with uh, Meyer's initials and the number 42. And they won their game 42 to three. Draw your own conclusions, but sometimes things just work out as they should. The really eerie thing, the previous week, their very important win over Ohio State, the great rivalry with Michigan, they scored 42 points in that game as well. We go into the holiday season. It's important to remember these little reminders of humanity and however people want to remember or take good from a tragedy. Let's just take the win and find good in the darkness in this season that is supposed to be about light. That'll do it for Hertel Radio for this edition. We thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll keep doing it as long as you keep listening. Uh, Hertel Podcast available. New episodes coming out soon. Hertel Radio available right here, however you're listening and on watching. If you're on the YouTube or on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, tune in. However you're listening, please do subscribe so you don't miss it. If you have the ability to leave a comment and a rating, that would be great. It lets folks know our little program is worth checking out. We'd sure appreciate it. We're going to have some big news coming up. We're going to be partnering with uh, Big Talker Radio and their streaming service. They are going to be streaming these episodes. Uh, once those are scheduled and on a rotation, we'll let you know. So check that out. Uh, working on getting the video feed. So their Facebook page, you'll be able to watch the show in the near future. But until then, however you're finding us, wherever you're finding us, we appreciate your time. I'm Andrew Donaldson. This is Hertel Radio, wherever you and yours are. Thank you so much for the time and y'all take care of each other. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.